Hi there, it's Tracy from Natural Childbirth World and today I have the privilege of speaking to a, an amazing person, a world-renowned expert in all things natural birth. Her name is Dr. Sarah Buckley. If you're not familiar with Sarah's work, let me just fill you in a, li a little bit. Um, she's originally from New Zealand now lives in, in Brisbane, near Brisbane, in sunny Queensland, Australia. She's written several books, including her bestseller, Gentle Birth, Gentle Mothering. Put a picture on the screen there. I was actually lent this when I was pregnant for my first baby almost five years ago. It was, very, it was a, a great read. Um, amazing information. She's a GP, family physician, with qualifications in GP obstetrics. And she's also a mother of four beautiful children who, surprisingly, you might find, that were all born at home. Uh, she's been featured in several films, including the latest one, Freedom of Birth, and is being described as a person who is who marries the medical mind and the birthing woman's body wisdom. She's into ecstatic birth, attachment parenting, co-sleeping, long-term breastfeeding, lotus birth, raising babies without nappies and diapers, yoga in pregnancy, and mothering, and uh, gentle discipline. Plus, she's also launched a new website, which we'll talk about a little later. So, Sarah, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Tracy. A pleasure to be here. And thank you for the work that you do. I love your ebook. It's a real, it's a great read. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. All right. So, look, there's so many things I could ask you because, you know, there, I could really delve into some things in depth, you know, being a bit of a birth junkie myself. But I really want to... Um, you know, there's a lot of people that follow our website and on our Facebook page and they are new mothers or perhaps they've not had a, a first, uh, you know, their first birth experience hasn't been great. So I kind of want to ask some questions for them. And um, some of the topics I've sort of picked out today that I want to touch on is what you call ecstatic birth. Then I've got some questions that people have asked on our Facebook page. Um, an interesting one I found, raising babies without nappies. I have to ask you about that. And, well, of course, your new website. So, first of all, let's start with ecstatic birth. What do you mean by ecstatic birth? Well, ecstatic birth, if you look at the, what the word actually means, it means, ek means outside and static means place. So, it's an experience that takes us outside ourselves. So, I use the term in that sense. But I also use it in a, in a physiological sense, you could say, because what I say about ecstatic birth, I say it's Mother Nature's um, superb design for mothers and babies. It's a, it's a blueprint. It's a hormonal blueprint that Mother Nature has for every mammalian mother and baby. And there's a lot of hormones that release, we release during labor and birth. And when I talk about ecstatic birth, I talk about in particular four of the hormones. And if you want to know more about this, I recommend you go to my website, sarahbuckley.com, and download my free ebook called Ecstatic Birth Nature's Hormonal Blueprint for Labor. So I talk about the hormone oxytocin, hormone of love, the hormone beta endorphin, which is a hormone of pleasure and transcendence. I talk about adrenaline and noradrenaline, hormones of excitement and prolactin, which is a hormone of breastfeeding and tender mothering. And we get peak levels of all of those hormones um, during labor and at that time of birth and for the hour after birth. So we're, we're saturated. We're, we've got these um, extreme levels of love, of pleasure and transcendence, of excitement and of tenderness and tender mothering. So it's, a, it's an ecstatic hormonal cocktail, you could say. And it's not just – Mother Nature doesn't design it just as a good feeling. You know, if you've had a – a really positive experience of birth, you'll know what I'm talking about, all of those amazing euphoria and ecstasy that you feel when you meet your baby. But it's not just about a good feeling, it's actually about survival for mothers and babies. So when the mother gets this big head of ecstasy, of peak levels of her ecstatic hormones, it actually protects her from bleeding from those high levels of oxytocin. Um, it makes sure that she bonds to her baby. You know, it, um, it activates the reward centers in her brain so that she will um, be, as I say, positively addicted to her baby because that's about species survival. You know, that look, that feeling you have when you look in your baby's eyes is not just a good feeling. It's really mother nature making sure that you're rewarded and motivated enough to do all those things things that every mammalian mother does for her baby, which is carry, you know, for us, we need to carry our babies around 24-7 for most of human history. That's been a necessity. And we need to breastfeed. So all of these hormones also optimize breastfeeding. You know, the oxytocin and the beta endorphin that are released in labor begin to stimulate prolactin release. It starts to switch on the milk production for you and your baby. So ecstatic birth is mother nature's superb design. And it really optimizes outcomes for mothers and babies, not just in terms of safety at birth but also in terms of ease and pleasure and ongoingly optimizes breastfeeding and mother-baby attachment. 
I, I find it interesting because obviously you have that credibility of, of being a doctor and um, so it it sort of sounds like a lot of the stuff where, you know, say I will talk about I'm not medically trained or other people who are childbirth educators or, or midwives sometimes can come across as all this stuff's a bit hippie, but it's not, is it? No, no, it's not hippie <laughs> at all. It's just, it's normal. It's what Mother Nature designs. It's our, it's our physiology in fact, you know, the new, the, the new way we describe it, we say physiologic birth, you know, childbirth that is, um, follows our physiologic blueprint, the way our body processes are designed to operate. So it's not a hippie, it's not out there. I mean, it, it is different to our normal um, obstetric system, our normal maternity care system. And, you know, I would say from a hormonal perspective, one of the reasons that women have so much difficulty in labor and birth is that their hormonal orchestration doesn't flow. And the main reason that our hormonal orchestration doesn't flow when we get stuck in a, in a hospital in an unfamiliar environment is exactly the same if it was a cat or a dog or a horse. And people that breed animals know that, you know, the core requirement for the laboring female is that she feels private and safe and, and, and essentially unobserved, but we don't sort of apply that to women. We put them in a situation where they're not private, they're on totally foreign territory, they've got strangers looking after them and they're intensely observed and all of these things, in any other man would switch labour off and that's essentially what happens to women in labour, the levels of the fight or flight hormones go up and her labour gets turned off and it can even deprive the baby of blood and oxygen. So when we put women in this foreign and you know, unphysiological situation, it's no surprise that many women need um, intervention because labour slows down and because their baby is deprived of blood and oxygen. And that's just a hormonal effect. It's the, the fight or flight hormones kicking in, as they should do in, for all mammalian mothers. Right. So... Say I, I saw your example in your in your book where you have you know the the cat and you're showing you know how the cat labors in the cupboard and you know when you disturb it 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 you know obviously slows labor down and things like that so so what you're saying is say you know your partner drives you speeds you to the hospital in the car and you're going over every bump and then you put on it you know a um, birthing bed and you've got fluoro lights on are you saying that that pretty much slows birth and changes you know doesn't optimize the right hormones well most women find that when they go into hospital you know it's all been going well at home and you move into hospital and you know suddenly things slow down or even stop and it takes you a while to settle in and again feel comfortable feel you know like it, it, it's really operating at the primal level the things i'm talking about it's our primal systems it's the middle layer of our brain called the limbic system so it's not a conscious thing you can't talk yourself into feeling safe somewhere yeah. and uh, w one way to look at it it's a bit like the conditions that we need for having a baby are very similar the, to the conditions we need for making a baby so uh -huh. it's all exactly the same hormonal orchestration and you could imagine imagine that same scenario you know you're trying to make a baby and then you get shipped off to hospital and you're in this strange room and nothing's really gonna happen is it <laughs> so you may settle down and feel private and safe again and then the whole thing can flow and it's it's exactly the same situation for for having a baby and you now that's quite a good rule of thumb really if you want the ideal conditions for labor and birth you think about the ideal conditions for making a baby and uh you know bright lights and strangers coming in and out through an unlocked door is not ideal you know and at the very minimum, if you're going to hospital, you need someone to protect your space. Right. So that was my next question: um, is how do you then have a you know an, an ecstatic birth and conditions that are optimum? Say if you're, uh, I can understand how you can do it at home, but obviously a lot of people are not comfortable at home this day and age. Many of the people that are on our website and our Facebook page are going to a hospital. How do we have that ecstatic birth at a hospital? Well, there's a couple of things to say. Um, at the, the whole hormonal system, there's a whole lot of what we call positive feedback loops. The hormones just get building on themselves, and that happens as labor progresses. As you as you go into labor, you sort of get deeper into it, you could say. And it's the early stages of labor where you're most likely to get disrupted by your environment. So huh. one thing is to stay at home until you're really in established labor, and that can take a little while if you're a first-time mum. And I would really recommend um, generally if you're going to hospital that you have a supportive birth companion with you, also called a doula. And a doula is someone that generally you engage and you pay, someone who's experienced in this area, who's used to being in hospitals and working in hospitals, who can support you and also support your partner. You know, I don't think it's enough to just take your husband in there personally. I wouldn't do that. If I was going to hospital, I'd definitely have a doula right. um, support myself and my husband and to create that safe space. You know, they really know how to do that in the hospital setting. So have a doula, have her come 
and support you at home and then go to hospital with her and she can really um, give you some good advice. And, and of course, the other option, and I think at the moment the only way to have your own midwife is to have your baby at home, but increasingly there's models of care where you can have your own midwife who can come um, come to you in labour at home and then accompany you and care for you in hospital. And I think um, you know, in the next few years we'll see that more and more available and that's really the, the by far the best model of care possible for women because you have that person. And I remember myself with my first baby, you know, um, I went to labour at 36 weeks and I was at home and I was a little, oh, my God, I'm a bit scared, this is a bit surprising, you know. Um, and I remember my midwife walked in the door and just seeing her, I just totally relaxed. I thought, wow, I feel really safe with this woman. I know her through all the time, all the times we've had together in my pregnancy, she knows me, I know her, and there was something that relaxed in me that allowed me to give birth to my baby about 20 minutes later. Um, wow. So, you know, having someone to, to to help to protect your space is really important, and if you're going to hospital, it's even more important. So I'd really recommend having a doula, um, at least having someone that's comfortable with the whole birth scenario and comfortable with working in hospitals. And I'd also recommend going to hospital later, you know, um, when labor is really established and the hormonal physiology is really flowing. Um, it's much less, less less interferable, you could say, by your environment at that stage. Right. Even I could even say that sometimes um, towards the very end of labor and birth, um, you know, getting a, a little bit of fear or anxiety or feeling a little bit... Um, uh, unsafe can actually trigger labour. It's a reflex um, for mammals birthing in the wild when you're close to the time of birth. Sometimes they can actually promote labour. So that's that story where you go into a hospital at the last minute and you have your baby like 20 minutes later because the sort of unfamiliarity can even trigger labour. And, um, um, you know, yeah, so going into hospital later, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend that. And, and I can understand that that might be, be a bit tricky. So, you know, have your own birth companion, with you. have your own daughter to come home, come to your home and accompany you. Mm -hmm. What about a lot of people will obviously have an obstetrician, depending on what country they're in. Um, it seems that Australia and the US, especially the UK, uh, I don't think as much, but you know they all hire those obstetricians. And I and I often ask. Um, I was talking to my cousin on the weekend, and I said, "Oh, so so why did you hire an obstetrician? Was it was there something wrong? Were you guys high risk or something?" And they said, "Oh no, well it was just you know we wanted the best care and." It really wasn't going to cost us that much with our insurance and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, are they not an extra companion at, at birth that would be, you know, beneficial or how does how does that affect labour, I guess? It, that's a great question. That's a great question. And um, I think that, you know, instinctively we do know that we need that continuity of care. We need, know that we need someone familiar in labour and the only way that's available to us in the current system, apart from hiring a doula, is to have your own obstetrician. Yeah. But the truth is, well, first of all, you're not really going to see much of them in labour. They'll probably only just come at the end. The second thing is you've got to consider that obstetricians aren't trained in normal birth. They're not the experts in normal birth. That's a midwife. Mm. So obstetricians are trained in high-risk birth, and they see a lot of high-risk things. They see a lot of things go wrong, and that's perfectly, that's exactly as it should be. They're specialist in the area. Mm. So it's sometimes a little hard for them to... to um, facilitate or even understand natural birth. They don't really see very many of them. You know, an obstetrician could go through years of training and not actually see a woman have totally natural birth. So if you're wanting a natural birth, you know, it's like going to McDonald's and asking for a porterhouse steak. You're just not going to the right place if you want a natural birth. Um, Marston Wagner, who used to work for the World Health Organization, he's a um, perinatologist, a high, highly trained obstetrician, and he said, you know, having an obstetrician attend a healthy woman in labour and birth is like having a paediatrician come and babysit your healthy two-year-old. It's just right. it's just not necessary. It's an, an, an over um, overuse of technology. And the other way that I, I talk about it, because my background is as a GP, you know, um, when people come to see me as a GP, you know, they come in to see me for primary care and I'm the expert in that and they've got a headache and I can say, well, you know, we do this test and you might need this or you might need that. Um, but if they went straight to a neurosurgeon with a headache and then the neurosurgeon would do a lot more fancy things because they see people with serious conditions with headaches and it's exactly the same thing in pregnancy. You know, a pregnant woman really needs someone to give them primary care, which again is really you know, the specialty function of a midwife. And um, at the moment we don't have a lot of availability of your midwife in hospital, um, in the hospital system. Some hospitals do have some schemes where you can have, have your own midwife, the hospital will give you your own midwife. Um, and birth centres in particular, I really recommend a much better model of care than, than, um, than getting your own obstetrician. And you're much more likely to have a good outcome. You know, if you look at the risks in private hospitals, your risk of all the interventions are significantly 
higher. So just looking at the figures, you know, you'd say that the best choice for a natural birth is to um, is to hire your own midwife, hire your own doula, um, and, and not and not actually go down the private hospital route. Mm-hmm.